I miss the fire playing synthesizers. I want my walls with more plaques on them than the inside of my fifth incisor. Shit gets wilder than Gene. Willy Wonka, Tonka trucks in my garage. Papa Zan, I'm in the motherland. Take off. Private flights to Virgin Islands A smile can turn the dimes Rough night until your virgin smiling Sitting sideways in the caddy on the highway Player like a puppet, give a vocal exercises they Hang my jersey off the rafters of the opposite team you know I'm a velociraptor chomping on rhinoceros meat Nike ID made of ostrich feet It's odd not to see a model in the opposite seat what? I park my flying saucer on the opposite street The glove box is a cacophony of parking receipts The armrest is an armory, I'm armed to the teeth Pop the trunk or pop a bottle, all nonsense to me F. Hip-hop writer is a creator, composing understanding words of culture, brilliance, powering a rebalance of the elements equally. Pages of rejuvenated reaffirmation, simply the almighty leadership of insightful craft work that stands to build through any confrontation born to be. Yet his daily duty is as a journalist that questions properly, uses his ears for the good to filter the real. And as the art decays by dilution, he concentrates the best again and again, exposing it in the print. Today's journalist and tomorrow's historian, he listens to share. Here is that necessary attempt executed again and again and again. This is the Power Right Show on S Street Media. This is your brother, the lone low life with the home sewn garment, the Boricua with the build, the true and living God stepping in score. Soon, yes, Allah, a.k.a. Skill Straight Alone. We're on S Street Media, the evolution of media. Every intrigue will have its own show. Every incredible thought will have its own episode. And every timeless insight will be archived. And because it's been a long time for me, not really for y'all, but this is the only show about my element of hip hop, the writer of what I say is art on art and science on music. So the only show in history on the hip hop writer element that I, a veteran over 20 years, helped to pioneer, right? So the creative writer, the journalist of integrity, the historian of insightful worth, right? And um, we have a great guest, you know what I mean? And I, I only have one, I only have one segment that is not related to my guest. In fact, it's so not related to my guest that it'll be a perfect segue to my guest. It's a, it's a segue that I haven't done in a while, so it is my who gives a fuck segment. And um, on this show, we talk about the music, we talk about the art, we talk about other genres that all affect hip hop culture, music, the integrity of things. And this who gives a fuck segment means and who really gives a fuck? Not who gives a fuck, but why should you give a fuck? So on this show, really quickly, this segment, today's segment is basically Kanye versus Drake or anybody in between inside that cipher. As of now, at the date, it's real time. Not one single iota of music of quality has been affected by this beef. No one has issued any kind of musical integrity with this beef. And um, nothing's happening with this. So we're going to keep it moving. That was the Who Gives a Fuck segment. And if it was short, it's because I don't give a fuck about it. So I want to introduce you to my guest because there's a lot to build on. Um, he's part of what I consider one of the greatest groups of this invisible renaissance, okay? When we talk about groups, there are groups, and then better word here for what we're talking about here is crews, and probably one of the greatest crews, a crew that when I talk about the invisible renaissance, I'm talking about the 2010s, okay? Those 2000s were the dark ages though, so if you think Swiss beats had the hottest beats of all time, you're, you're um, you're a byproduct of the dark ages, okay? You're a byproduct of the tinnying of, of drums, the, the high trebling of, of tracks, and the lack of bass and filtering of drums. But um, 
this invisible renaissance is much different. And one of the greatest crews of all time to me, meaning that when I say a great crew of the Invisible Renaissance, I think they're a crew, what I say is a crew or individual artists that they could match up if they were released in the 90s. But of course though, in real, in real life, they couldn't be released in the 90s because the brilliance of the 90s is what molded these individuals. And that crew I'm talking about is broken, the Broken Home crew. And um, we have one of these brothers in here. The proper introduction is, with his own words, he is an expert coxman who recites rhymes written in his leather-bound book made from pterodactyl wings. He's basically that dynamic action figure in the Polo Mansion. <laughs> My brother, F.U. is with us. Peace, peace, peace. What's going on, Suyez? Oh, man, what's going on is, um, you know, I've been, at the end of the year, I, especially December, I spent a lot of time going through all the records I've heard this year. Right. And I was I was pissed off that yours went past my radar because I just put it in my head and said, yeah, yeah, I got to get that. And I didn't get it immediately. And I realized, and I was saying to this to you off air, that there is no MC I could think of that's even like you remotely. Like, And this is common with Broken Home. You know, a lot of great crews, right. they might have five, six, four, right? Yeah. Low number, even if they're a low number. And sometimes they're all good but they, they maybe come from the same region or something, and they all sound similar. Yeah. You guys all sound different. No one gets Spit Gems confused with A1. Right. No one gets GS Advanced confused with you. You know what I'm saying? All they are so distinct and so different that it's just, like, so much fun to hear. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we all have, we all have our own style, man, and that's, and that's the great thing about it. I, yeah. I, I, every time I listen to a crew or something like that, I feel like there's always that one standout, Maybe two standouts, you know what I mean? And right, then right. a couple of their boys that just came along for the ride. But that might not be the case. I just feel that way because they all sound the same. And it just, you know, it all right, gets recycled right. in my head. And I'm like, all right, whatever. I just attribute maybe a dope line to one person, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Whereas with us, man, it's, to me, those three guys are my favorite rappers. You know what I'm saying? GS Advance, A1, Spit Gems, the shit they say is crazy. Mm -hmm. So when I rap, I don't rap for fans and I don't rap for other MCs, I rap to try to outdo them. You know what I'm saying? Like a, a line that they might have spit that may, maybe never came out or maybe did come out or is going to come out that I heard, right, and I right. just try to outdo that. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. I want to put out a single that A1's going to be like, damn, son, you killed let, it. You know what I'm saying? That GS going to yeah. hit you like, yo, son, that line is crazy. I want to get back into Broken Home on another thing. Put yeah, you yeah. on the spot with Broken Home. Right. But... I want to go, I want to rewind and get those Spider-Man origins. The, you know, because, I, you know, I, I know that when you were coming up with your name F.U. It was because you were writing all these aliases right. when you was doing open mics and stuff. And that stuck with the crowd and, and things. But I like to hear what gets you to, to write. And I, for the audience, why is this always an important question? It's not an important question with the bullshit rappers that you're listening to. You know, nobody wants to hear about the, the multicolored wig, wig wearing <laughs> rapper that, that why his origins, his origins are what he saw on TV and his desires to have fame. When I ask an MC about their origins, especially FU right here, it's because they have, they're coming with a base of insight of information and obviously coming from so many fields of creative arts. Then I'm like, why this one? Right. You know what I'm saying? So, like, when you were doing hip-hop, or when you got into hip-hop, like, when would you say, like, yo, I'm going to MC, I'm going to do this? Well, I mean, it's funny because when I first started rapping, it was just a thing to do. It wasn't something I took seriously. Mm -hmm. It was something that everybody in the neighborhood got together in a corner and ciphered, you know what I mean? And we would battle each other. You know, in, in in Queens, right? And you're yeah, from Corona, yeah. right? I'm from Corona, Queens, originally. Right, right, well, right. I, you know... I mean, I was born in Peru. I came to, right. to Corona when I was five, and I've been all around the map since then. But, yeah, Queens is my home. But, you know, I'm talking junior high. This is maybe 92, you know what I mean, in high school, you know, mm -hmm. in the mid-90s. And people were just rapping, bullshitting. I never took it seriously. Even when I was going to open mics, you know, I was, I was more of a fan and just bullshitting. You right. know, I never really took it seriously. I didn't start taking it seriously till the 2000s. And if you hear some of my raps, I, I, I'll tell you plainly, I'm still not taking it seriously. <laughs> I still haven't sat down and said, all right, 
I'm going to make a record and I'm going to take it seriously. I've never done that. It's always just like, yo, that beat is dope. Let me just write some shit. and It might mm. be bullshit or it might take me in this direction or it might take me in that direction. But um, it was hip-hop was just, you know, hip-hop was just always there. You know mm. what I mean? It was really the first. I moved to, to, to Queens in 1986. And before that, all I had ever heard was uh, Spanish music. You know, salsa, boleros, stuff like mm -hmm. that. Uh, but I remember touching down in Queens and my uncle, the first hip hop record, I remember it very vividly. And it's funny because it was in Queens, was The Bridge Is Over. You know? That you fucking heard The Bridge Is Over as your yeah. first record in Queens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was uh, it's just that piano, man. The piano and then, you know, the thum, thum, tss, tss, thum, tss, just coming out mm -hmm. of his room. And I was like, yo, what is it? It was like a Bugs Bunny cartoon where the pie is like, leading him to the windowsill to steal right, the pie right. you know that shit was leading me into the room to to question what it was and you know I was yeah pretty and much it's funny because it makes me think who dared to play that in queens <laughs> yo a lot of people right? play that shit in queens, yeah yeah right? it was just too dope right like, yeah it was just too dope so <laughs> I'm from brooklyn though so it had no like bearing on right, right. how we played it <laughs> but, uh, trust me that shit got a lot of play in queens because it was just that dope you know what i right, mean right. and that's why it's such a classic record because mm -hmm. even though they were dissing queens Motherfuckers and Queens still played it, you know what I mean? Right, right. And, you know, as a side note, this is something I hear from everyone and I, everybody that knows the music, writes about the music. It really is a, a real good theory that Karis One's destruction of Queens actually leads to them probably being the, the heaviest borough of MCs ever. Yeah, I think so. Because if you go pound, like, amount of quality MCs and next level MCs, Queens is really winning. They have the most. There was there was a time um, before KRS One when the Juice Crew was really popular that Queens was the borough to be from. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? MC Shan, you yeah. know, you, you had uh, G Rap. Ace, yeah, yeah, it, yeah it, it was the borough to be from. KRS destroyed them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then for a while, you know, you 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 you, you know, you were from Brooklyn or you were from the Bronx. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, a lot of yeah. people didn't step up and say they were from Queens unless you were in Queens. You know right, what I mean? Right. Um, but I think, like you said, it lit a fire under those MCs yeah, to be like, this yeah. ain't going to happen again. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and if it does, it's not going to be it, a it, destruction. It's going to yeah, be it can't. equal. With the MCs, you know, like, it just can't. Like, right. it's I think foolish. That, I think that's what I, I mean. Again, man, you yeah. know, like, I must have been five years old when that record came out. So I can't speak from experience. Mm -hmm. I could just speak from, you know, looking back. Yeah. And, you know, Queens is one of the, the neighborhoods with the probably, even still to this day, one of the most eclectic and diverse um, Latino neighborhoods, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Because where I'm from in Sunset Park, at the time it was just Boricuas, you know? And if you were Dominican, you still said you was Boricua, you know what I <laughs> mean? And we knew, we knew they weren't if they had jerry curls, <laughs> you know, because they was, they was Boricuas always out there. don't grow jerry yeah. curls? No, no, it, no, but I'm saying it was like the, it was like the 90s and they had jerry curls. <laughs> and we're like, yo, you, unless you're Ice Cube and you came from right, Compton, right, yeah, you we know here? you're Dominican, right? right? <laughs> but, you know, then we go to Queens and like every, every, everybody from Latin America is there. And it's yeah. such, how does, how is it going, doing hip hop with such a eclectic vibe of, of different types of music and culture and all of that? You know what, it's, I'm glad you bring that up. Where, where I grew up, um, so I grew up, uh, I lived in Granger and Martens, which is right behind Left Rack City. So up the block lived Cool G Rap. Um. Down the block was Spaghetti Park, notorious for mobsters and Italian. Like, if you weren't Italian, you weren't hanging out there. Okay. Point blank. And down from that was the 7 train, Roosevelt Ave, mm -hmm. which was straight up Latin American, Ecuadorian, Colombian, Peruvian, and that's all that was there. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But these were literally a block or two away in any given direction. You know what I'm saying? So all that stuff surrounding me, I always found beauty in all those types of music, you know, my grandfather was Peruvian, but he wanted to be Italian, so he was always <laughs> banging that Frank Sinatra, you know what I mean, all mm -hmm. of them kind of doo-wop groups, you know what I mean, right, um, right. my uncle was a hip-hop head, he was a graffiti writer, so he was banging that, that hip-hop, you know what I mean, my parents just coming from Peru, they were into that salsa, you know, um, around that time, Hector Lavoe was coming out, so oh, the yeah, final yeah, records yeah, yeah. was all My popping. goat, that's my goat, by he, the way, yeah. You know what I mean, all that stuff was popping, so... I soaked all of that in. Mm -hmm. And being that I could speak Spanish and I could, and I could speak English at the same time, I found true lyricism 
in both those worlds. To me, Hector Lavoe is a GOAT because of the things that he said. Right, right, yeah, not yeah. Not just, if he had a wonderful voice, people called mm -hmm. him the voice, right? Right. But it's not just that, it was the words that he said and mm -hmm. how he expressed right, them. Right, right, and to for, me, for the audience, and I've said this before, um, we always talk about the roots uh, of, of black music that led to hip hop being like Jamaican, you know, Jamaican toasting, at least to MCing, but MCing comes from a lot of varied places, whether it's James Brown. And also, if salsa was being developed in the 70s, that was the first urban New York City genre, not hip hop. And they were rhyming because when you do salsa, not this candy salsa now, but when you do a salsa song, you do the said lyrics of the song, and then it's call and response where every call right. has to rhyme with the next call. You know, so you do your verse that you make up, then the chorus, then you rhyme what you just for, with what you just said before. And usually those are on the spot. And Lavo had some of the greatest ones. Yeah, that you definitely. Could, could ever hear. You I, know? I was always entranced by the things that people were saying, mm. you know, no matter what genre of music right, it was. Right. And I'm a huge fan of rockers, reggae, too, because back then. Sure. You know, it was it was also a revolution of that rockers, reggae, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. And. and but it was just the things they were saying, man. You know, certain things like that Bougie was saying at the time was like super mm -hmm. dope to me, man. It was, right, you know right. what I'm saying? It wasn't, like you said, this candy-ass music. And now I, I play music sometimes. I'm in the car with my lady, and she, you know, she likes Rihanna, Beyonce. I don't hate on anything that she likes, sure. but I'll listen to shit. She's like, why do you always listen to, like, sad-sounding music? And I'm like, babe, <laughs> these people are saying something from the heart. You mm -hmm. can hear their pain. Right, Fucking right. Rihanna, I can't feel her pain, man. I don't feel like it's real. <laughs> right, As a right. matter of fact, I know for yeah, a fact yeah. a dude wrote that song. It, it's, it's so there's no yeah. emotion in it. it. It's funny you said that because pop music, to to you know, for a long time, may, you know, maybe we could find roots in it. Maybe with disco, with the disco, you know, discoization of R and B and soul. But even even more, even pop versions of music back then had more lyricism. Right, right. You know what I mean? So like you mentioned Frank Sinatra, that was more of a pop jazz yeah, style. Yeah, But he had a lot of lyrics. Right, yeah. He had heavy lyrics, so, and of course he emoted them. Uh, dude, if you, you know, listen to My yeah. Way, My Way is one of my favorite songs because mm -hmm. I feel like that speaks to me, the person that I am. He's on that song saying, yo, I do shit my way. Yeah. Do shit you can't say nothing about. Mm -hmm. And that... That's so hip hop. You yeah, know yeah, what I'm yeah. It's that's the so, most hip hop like, song. Son, yeah. If you think about it, he's like, "Yo, son, I'm so ill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do whatever I want. I don't bow down to nobody. <laughs> that's so Nas and Mob Deep yeah, to yeah, me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's it's like I always listen to the things that people were saying, and that shit always drew me. Um, that's what always drew me to the music that I like more so than the actual uh, beats and 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 you know the instrumentation. Of interesting, it. interesting. It was more so what they were saying. You know, in your in your lyricism, right? The the your style of MCing is extremely unique. I'm gonna describe it as we go along later for for the listeners the way I'm seeing it. But um, I'm gonna go back in. Yeah, in fact, I'm gonna keep going because I want to go back into that and tie in some of my theories mm -hmm. because you know about coming from different cultures and coming from different ethnicities and stuff and how that affects the way we rhyme and stuff. You right. know what I mean? We see it blatantly with certain, you know, with certain people like Karis One and the Jamaican roots, but we don't always see it with other people. And I think that it's something to highlight if we say, because it might be unconscious and stuff, you know what I mean? But I'm going to get to that in, the, in a minute. So I want to talk about these origins. Like, when do you start saying, like, yo, I'm good enough to be worthy of recording something? Okay, really, that really came later on. Um, you know, I'm 36 right now. I, I think that came along when I was 30. Mm -hmm. For a long time in my early 20s, there was a lot of freestyle. Um, I used to I used to uh, street team for Ruckus back when I was 18, and every street team street team crew used to battle another street team crew. So you had to be ill with it, you mm. know what I mean? So the Ruckus crew had to be the illest with the lyrics, you right. know what I'm saying? We would battle like the Sony crew or the Bad Boy crew. They had a different style, you know what I mean? But it wasn't really serious. It was fun, you know. We would just you know, fucking broke stick up kids putting up <laughs> posters, you know, right, all over right. my hand. It was it wasn't that serious. After that, and I would go to the open mics again. The open mics was for fun, man. It mm -hmm. was mostly like I wanted to go and kind of like sell a little bit of coke, you know what I'm saying, and make a little bit of money and <laughs> sell a little bit of weed and 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 outside they're ciphering, you know what I mean, and uh, 
you know, Breeze Ever Flowing might be outside with Sea Rays and then you jump mm-hmm. in, you know. Uh, first time I met Immortal Technique was uh, uh, outside of Wetlands and shit. Right, know? right. He One was, of the great battle rappers. Yeah, a lot definitely. Of people don't know, yeah. He was out there rapping and shit. And then you jump in, you know what I mean? But it was never that <laughs> serious. Like I said, I didn't even right, have right. a name at the time. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was just making up different names. So nobody can go back and say, oh, yeah, I remember FU because they don't. My, that wasn't mm-hmm. even my name back then. Then I started DJing. I never made beats. I've never even tried. But I did used to DJ because, you know, I just love the music so much that I figured, yo, let me get in there and let me spin what they want to hear, but I'm going to throw in some shit I want to hear mm. and see what rocks, you know what I mean, and see what sticks to the wall. So I always did that. I did that for years. And um, I DJed a show for Spit Gems, and we connected on some low-life shit just on the Internet, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? The Internet's a beautiful thing, man. You know, you know what I mean? It right, connects right. so many people. We connected on that yeah, level. Yeah, definitely. I just, definitely just listening that. to his songs, I was like, yo, son, you know, I typed, I'm like, yo, son, she fucking, you're next level ill. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Let me DJ a show for you. Boom. They were like, yo, we need somebody to DJ the show. So I packed up my shit and I showed up there in an hour. I DJed the show without zero warning. They brought me back to the studio. They're like, yo, just DJ for us from now on. Ill. So now I'm in Goblin Studio. You know what I mean? What year is this? Just so everybody gets an idea. I would say 2010. Okay. Yeah, it was 2010. And, and for the listener, to me, if we take a hit, when we look back in the history of the two, this invisible renaissance, I call it, the, that early, the early part of this decade, the Goblin Studios is crucial. Yeah. To some of the greatest music. And that includes you guys. You know what I mean? It was a great time, man. Yeah. The, the, the 2010 and, and on was a great time. And so we were there chilling, um, you know, just days on end, just hanging out, you know, just coming back. And, you know, I wanted to feel that vibe, you know, like we'll be chilling and smoking and watching Kung Fu flicks and Large Pro might walk in and fucking do a mm-hmm. track. So now you're sitting in the studio with Large Pro, you know what I'm saying? You might be sitting in the studio with Cormega, you know what I mean? He right, might kick right. you out, but you <laughs> might not, you know what I'm saying? Right, it was right, just right. a fun time. You, you yeah. never knew who was going to pop up, you know? Um, yeah, Mayhem was coming around. Bronson was coming around a lot at the time. Mm. Um, a lot of people were. And uh, Gems was writing a song. The beat was knocking. I'm just sitting there chilling. Something got into me where I'm like freestyling in my head. I wrote down maybe like five or six bars. Um, and I, I forgot what song it was, and I forgot how the song goes, but I know it was like satellite crashes, walking off the spaceship with Samsonite baggage. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, just keep going. And Gems was like, yo, that's dope. <laughs> like, yo, you got to finish that and come and be on this track and shit. And I'm like, oh, for real? And I finished the verse, and everybody liked it, and I jumped on the track, and then I got the bug, man, from then on. I'm like, yo, so I'm going to keep writing. I kept writing, and and uh, Golden Child, uh, who's a producer hanging out there at mm-hmm. the time, he was like, yo, let's do something. Come back to my lab. And I went back to his lab, and we recorded my first uh, mixtape, which was Legend of the Gnome Sword. Um, so you consider that a mixtape? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay. I mean, in today's modern yeah, 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 yeah. language, I guess. You know what I mean? Because... We we didn't, it was something that we put together on the spot. You know, he made a beat. I wrote the rap. We recorded it and put right, a couple just, of them together I, and put it me, out. For me, I catalog it as an album because it was <laughs> totally original and, <coughs> and it was it had great songs on it. Yeah, no, I loved it, man. It was something that was, I wanted to say from the beginning, I never want to put out the same record twice. That's why Spicasso Dose is called Spicasso Dose because it's a second part to the first EP. You know what I mean? It just continues. Whereas uh, Legend of the Gnome Sword is called that. Well, it's called that because Golden Child used to cut up his weed with a little sword. <laughs> and we, we were high one day. I'm like, yo, who gave you this sword? Like a, a, a gnome? Where'd you get this shit from? You know what I'm saying? That's where the title came That's from. Funny, and from man. then on, we were, I was like, yo, so I'm going to write every track on some mythical shit. On mm-hmm. some mythical monster. Right, right. And this fucking, album produced Wizards Cookbook. Right, right. Some dope fucking type shit. And that's where we took the whole record. So right, every right. every title was on that mythical shit, and every every song was on that kind of genre. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And then when it came time to do the second a second mixtape or album, which is Bodega Businessman, which is where Drogas is on and uh, Firescape Life, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm not gonna talk anything about gnomes or mythical creatures. <laughs> that's that we did that. Right, right. Now I want to talk about some shit, some other shit. Let's talk some Donald Goyne shit. Let's tell some tales and shit. Okay. So we did that. We told some tales. Uh, when it came time to do another one, that's when I did uh, Papa Dios. And I was like, yo, let's do 10 tracks, 10 Bible stories or 10 biblical stories. So you decide this like you just say, let's do 10 tracks. Like, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's it. That's totally premeditated. Right. It's just yeah. yeah let's let's this this is where I want to go with it. Can can we do it? And in the meantime, you know, I'm doing verses for other people, or I might do a song for another project. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But when I you know when I focus on something, that's what I focus on. Right. Right. And uh. Yeah, that, that's kind of where I go with it. You know what I mean? I pick a direction I want to go to, and then that's where I go with it. But I'm sorry that we, we went somewhere else. 2010 is when I took it seriously. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm glad because we ended up going where I wanted to go, which is those albums and that, that all lead up to doing Spicasso. You know, but for the listeners, too, like, um, I'm going to go into his techniques and stuff and styling, though, but because, and, I, and what you do in the mic, but, when when I first saw you live, it was one of the most funniest things that I ever saw because I didn't expect it. You know, I think uh, the first time it? I saw you live was it um uh, um it was uh, the release party for uh, I think it was F Fuck the Radio uh-huh. Spit Gems Fuck the Radio uh-huh. and you came on though and I was like uh, let's see what song he does because you know he's got some dope songs and you just started reciting you just started rapping fresh prince of bel-air oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean and he didn't you didn't do the short version you know the one that comes up when you watch the thing and he did the whole thing but you didn't recite it like all whimsical like he like he does it and shit you right, recited right, it, it way. hardcore like yeah, yeah. and this shit came out so dope it was one of the most it, it really defines like the type of humor that you have and right, like right. that skill set in the humor because a lot of people couldn't really pull that off and shit like that. You know what I mean? Well, I want to, I want, you know, when I, when I do a stage show, when I do a show, I, I don't have the money for all these props and all these, you know, fucking, <laughs> right. I would love to bring a dragon on stage with me. You know what I'm saying? I can't, you know? Right. So I, I, I have to be the attraction. I have to be mm. the show. So I'm going to get on there and I'm going to do something to get your attention fast because the dude before me was ill. The mm-hmm. dude after me is ill. I'm in New York City where the whole crowd is all MCs. So they're all looking at me like, yeah, I could do better. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I could have done this better. That's what I see. But then again, I don't perform for them. Right. I perform for Spit Gems and GS Advance in the back who are looking at me going like, what are you going to do? You know, I perform for fucking Sunez who's like, all right, what's, what's going to happen? Right, you know what right. I mean? For the, for the motherfuckers who are paying attention. So I'm going to hit you with something funny so you can be like, oh, <laughs> shit, this motherfucker's bugged right. out. You know what I mean? And then I'll hit you with my shit. All right. So with that said, let's take a break. We're going to talk about the latest live show you did at, at Miami Art Basel, Miami's Art Basel with Thurston Howell and, and all the low lives. And we're going to get into the Spicasso, Spicasso Dose album. All right, cool. All right. I remind you of a young Eminem That's right. You remind me of a young little Kim A fucking bitch Sucking dick, trying to make it big I'm the newest Benz You're driving around with some used Tims I'm just a lion, I'm Lord Byron You're a peasant that be begging me to pour my wine You dressing like Cam Newton I wrestle like Baz Ruin You and your mans is mad stupid Me and my man stay studying mathematics and Rasputin you a Roz Cloud, I'm bumping Roz cars in a drop top. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking laugh at you losers. <laughs> Sip half a carafe yak and watch Back to the Future. Sniff a bag with my shooters, sit in the lab and build computers. Your main boot at me and my crew done oh, ran through her. I'm a human deuce deuce of the Medulla. You're a sun doula, a subhuman. The velocity of a toothpick flick to the moon. I bang fine hoes like Tito Puente bang Congos. Chacho, finally a band leader with a gram and a fanto. I'm El Chapo, you a fato. Trying to dance at the bar at Coco Bongo. Fuck out of here, man. Oyster perpetual motion, dive in the ocean, staring off the boat views from the Indian coast, smoking almond rose potion. As supermodels lather my torso from head to toe with sun lotion. More championship rings on my fingers than Saturn has. I solve mathematical patterns inside my paragraphs. Inscribe mind bending lyrics within an apple pad. Right now, flip this whole script in scrimshaw. You been flawed. I'm Mr. Perfect, and you're more like Chris Benoit. Kill yourself before you step to me. That's facts, though. Do I kill your family. You play me like an asshole. Asshole. 
Park the Aston on mother gas and you bastards are flabbergasted Ratchet clang is strapped to my ankle in case some static happens Some lip smacking and jibber jabbering to get your jaw shattered I'm on my dark lord I get drunk and throw objects at your heart like a dartboard Pobrecito, your style's mi hijo My sit raw perico, your small poquito I'm a beast on three coasts okay. Couldn't see me 365 plus a buck CeeLo My fuck you Shut up. Let's be realistic for a minute Am I cooking, huh? Let me take a look at this, huh? Is this what's happening in professional wrestling, huh? Very cocky A lot of charisma The most well-known The best looking The best dressed Custom-made clothes Gold around my neck Rolex watch around my wrist My shoes cost more than your house Drive a Lincoln Continental A Mercedes A Rolls Own a Corvette Live in the biggest house On the biggest side of town Shit airplanes And I got a limousine sitting out there A mile long With 25 women Just died for me to go Woo! show i'm your host suyez aka skiller straight hello and on that yo one of the things that if we go back into the the early this decade as well there was a lot you know the low lives are now not just boosters but a, a, a hip to me a hip-hop organization and there's something that thurston Howe always wanted it to develop into among other low lives and develop the influence that it had in fashion and the influence that it was already having in music mm -hmm. in in the other parts of the culture that people weren't really noticing was all there you know what i'm saying and one moment that i think of in the in my coverage was thurston howe was always calling for a flood from other artists that flood right right you know what i'm saying and all of a sudden though we get blessed with like all of this spit gem stuff we get blessed with your your work 
we go to the, all of these love and loyalty shows, and I see all you MCs out there, and I'm like, yo, it, it, and you put you brothers all together, it's like, what the fuck, you know what I mean? Like, it's a whole thing. So a lot of that culminates into another level with Miami's Art Basel that goes on every year and the, and the, the love and loyalty show that's part of it. And Thurston Howe has made it like a, a, it is now officially like one of the great hip hop events oh, yeah, of, the, of the year, you know what I'm saying? And you got a chance to go to that this year, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I was there. Thank you to Thurston Howe for having me uh, to the Low Life Miami family. It was a great, yo, I think that the Love and Loyalty show, and you might think I'm being biased, but it's it's the best hip-hop show at Art Basel. Because you have, you know, you have hip-hop shows where, like, Lil Pump might do a show. I think Lil Dicky did a show, and you know what I'm saying? But it's just, like, them rapping for 10 minutes, and then that's it. Mm -hmm. This was a whole day of LMCs, surprise guests. Like I was telling you right before my set, Wise Intelligent, Decided he wanted to do a yeah, set. Yeah, that was so ill. I was like, walk in legend, yo, you know, just, just walk in. in. This is a legend. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Who just, just wanted to jump on the mic right, and right. was chilling with us. You know, it's one of the illest events down there, man, for real, if you're a hip hop head. Mm -hmm. The crazy thing is that this year was like right across the street from Vice's headquarters. Not one person from Vice showed up. Really? It's so funny because wow. people were coming off the street because they heard the hip hop. You know what I mean? The DJs are XS, Ronin, um, Hakeem Green from Channel Live was, was hosting. They did an excellent job, and the music was so dope that people were coming off the street because they were hearing the beats, they were hearing right, people, right. they were hearing the crowd. Not one person from Vice came down. Mm, great journalism. They were more interested in the Lil Dicky show, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Which yeah. is like, come on, son. Like, the nigga's a comedian, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. It was, I just found it weird, but that was one of the, that was definitely the illest show down there. I'm glad to have been a part of it. Art Basel is a little weird, like I was telling you. Right, like, right. During the day, it's so dope. It's, you know, there's so much art going on, and there's so much vibrancy and light. You know what I mean? The energy's ill. It's, it, the energy's filled with artists. And at night, it's kind of filled with, like, Molly vampires and cokeheads and underage mm -hmm. girls and shit. And the night, the night time kind of fucking turned me off, but the daytime was so ill. And and the Love and Loyalty show was the highlight to me of, of, of that Art Basel weekend. That I was there, right? Definitely, definitely. The um, the reason I bring up this stuff with the low lives is because me, as I cover it, not just covering the low lives, not just covering the low life artists though, but also me getting L's as a low life, changes the whole dynamic when I cover it because now I have these L's not because I did anything about boosting or any right. of that stuff, but because I actually did things and do things in hip hop. Right. And it changes the, the guys. And from your your perspective as a low life who has done those things yeah. and has though that, that reputation a long time and is a great artist, where do you see the direction though of the low lives organization? Because it's taking big leaps as that hip hop organization. I mean I really see it becoming <laughs> um a, a global thing, you know what I mean? In 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 the vein of like the Zulu Nation, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And not to compare the two, but right, I'm just saying right. where, where it becomes a, an organization where everybody around the world mm -hmm. uh, joins and wants to be a part of. Um, it's something that has so far uh, maintained peace, you know what I mean? Because, you know, people ain't killing each other right. and doing all crazy shit no more. Yeah, in the 90s, I, I used to boost. It was actually a Korean girl who taught me to boost. You know what I mean? It was nobody from the hood. Mm -hmm. It was it wasn't a low life. It was it was a Korean girl who I was hanging out with and I couldn't afford a Nautica jacket. <laughs> and you know, my parents were poor and shit and I'm like, damn and she's like, Yo, why don't you just go in there and put it on and then put your jacket on over it and just walk out? And I'm like, No. And she's like, Yeah, it's, I mean you're thirteen years old, you're not gonna get in trouble. The worst thing they'll do is call your parents. And a light bulb went off in my head like, yo, <laughs> you're right. And then I just did that every day. You know what I mean? But I did it. It's crazy because I, I, I think I did it because, you know, I just wanted to look fly. Man, you man. know what I mean? It was something that when you're a kid, the people that you look up to are the people that look fly. You know what I mean? They mm -hmm. get attention and they get respect. You know what I mean? So you want to emulate that. And uh I, that's why I started doing it, you know what I mean? But um, the low-life culture was so much more than that. Yeah, it started as a boosting crew, um, but 
it's turned into so much more. It encapsulates all of hip hop now and journalism and TV. I think if you think about it, man, uh, Ralph Lauren clothing, I think is where it is because of the low life movement. Because think about it mm -hmm. in the 90s when it was huge, it was Tommy Hilfiger was also huge. Nautica was also huge. Guess was also huge. Right. Out of all of those, the one that's really still popping is Ralph Lauren. And now even more so because they've brought those old trends back that we've been wearing since the 90s. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The same shirts that are out now, I, I have those shirts. Right, right. Mine might be a little bit faded because I wear it all the time. <laughs> right, you, you know what I mean? But yeah, yeah, I have that shirt. I, I took that shirt off a guy on the seven train. <laughs> I remember he was wearing it and I was like, yo, now I'm going to wear it. <laughs> Memories. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I remember that shirt. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's kids in Peru wearing my 90s clothes because my mom would be like, oh, you don't wear that. I'm going to send it to your cousin in Peru. And I'm like, ah, yeah. whatever. Oh, man, it's the illest hand-me-down <laughs> yeah, so, And they don't even know it. They're walking around it with pee wings out there all dirty and shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They don't even know how ill it is. And I tell them, I'm like, yo, that shit is out now for like 600 bucks and they're trying to go back and dig in their closet for it. Oh, that's crazy. Well, you know what? Send that shit back, man. The, that line you had, uh, um, I forgot what song it was, where you said you was wearing stuff that... You're waiting online for shit that I threw away already. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, your closet's an eyesore. I throw away clothes that you're waiting in line for. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Word, word. But, yo, let, let's, <coughs> let's, take, let's take that and then go into, I want to talk about, go back to the MC, and as we introduce the Picasso Dos Deluxe, it is a mixture of one of last year's great, great EPs, yeah. the Picasso, and then, you just added more songs that are in that theme. Right. And it, it just put it together as a deluxe. So we really great artwork, by the way. I love the artwork. Oh, that, that was, was uh, Moss. You know? that's, that's my homie Moss uh, from the Tan Boys out in L.A. Yeah. Um, yeah, he killed it, man. <clears throat> Moss Graphics. Thank you, brother. Uh, follow Tan Boy Moss on, on Instagram. Hmm. Yeah, he, he killed it. He killed it. And he actually sent me both canvases because he painted both of those you know himself right wow. that wasn't done on a computer that wasn't put together he painted those he hand painted them and wow. he sent me both of those man and i'm, I'm honored to have worked with dude well, that's dope um yeah last year i got together with the curse who uh, uh is an up-and-coming producer from toronto he's got some bangers he's working with a lot of good people and uh he sent me beats and i'm like yo let's just put something together in the same vein and it was just gonna be spicasso it's just gonna be a little five six track ep um and uh, it was so ill that we just kept going, kept going. And once I released it, I realized I had three other songs. You know, let's just add another three songs to it right. and put out a part two <clears throat> next year. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So we put out part two. And Deluxe is just because I just put them together. Right. Picasso so was, all... yeah, there was no uh, physical. There was no CDs. It wasn't on iTunes or Spotify. It was only on Bandcamp and it was free. So when I put Picasso Dose out, I'm like, well, I'm going to put them together. And make physicals for the people who want CDs. You know mm. what I mean? We're making vinyl for the people who want vinyl. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, with extra bonus tracks on there. You know what I mean? And uh, so I just called that Picasso Deluxe, which is just part one and part two. Right, right. Yeah. And let, let's go, let me go back to just the isolation, because when I like to talk about an album, and we, we start building about this album that you have out now, and I do this with all the artists that I have, especially needs to be done with you, I like to highlight some things that I see so that when the listener listens, they're like, not just listening, like sometimes don't get something, but like, yo, damn, it's really as dope as soon as you said, and then you thank me right, right. You know, after, right? <laughs> but yo, to me, there's probably more if I think about it, but I had said that I don't hear an MC like you. It's very difficult to find MCs that even near that wavelength like that. You yeah. know what I mean? It might be for a track or two, but this is the whole thing. Like, yeah. you do everything like this, and I think three things that, I see that makes it so dope is the way that you enunciate, you know, like a lot of guys enunciate and they over enunciate and it sounds corny and right, nerdy. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking you about. You enunciate yeah. and it sounds even more brutal though. Like <laughs> it, it, it has that thing. Like when you said the Lord Byram line, yeah, yeah, yeah. it has that like petty, you know, <laughs> peon and shit. Like it has that thing and it just really adds to it. And a lot of that is because the the way that your your voice is, you know right, what I'm saying? Right. It wouldn't work with another guy's cadence or voice, yeah. you know what I mean? But then there's the other thing, right? That to, to listen for when you listen to it is like, um, especially here, it's all over this album. That's why I'm mentioning it. Is 
when we talk about vocabulary being deeper, sometimes we don't really get when it's used right, how a deeper vocabulary can make like things sound really good. It does two things that I can immediately say. It makes it sound better because a better word choice just has more ring to it. It's get different sounds that you never heard. Right. But then also you say more with less. So things like when you say magnanimous alphabet in my manuscript, yeah. when you say a simple thing like, a glove box is a cacophony of parking receipts. You know, you, <laughs> you could have said something else, but like you said something a lot of other guys might say pretty basic. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I ha then I have a line where I, I caught, I, I can't believe I caught flack for it because I thought it was an amazing line. <laughs> um, I'll pull your card through meditation. I'm a master of illusion and press the digitation. And, and I caught flack for it because nobody knows the fuck press the digitation is. It's mm. magic. Press the digitation is the, you know, the word for magic. You know right, what I mean? Yeah, so I didn't even know I'll, that. Yeah. I'll pull your card, you know, in the hood, when you somebody pulls your card, you know what I mean? They're putting you out on Front Street. Right. I'll pull your card through meditation. <laughs> Remember back in the days, right, the, right. the psychics, they would guess the card. You know, right, you'd right. have a card and they'd have to guess it. Mm -hmm. I'll pull your card through meditation. I'm a master of illusion and press the digitation. So I caught so much flack for that. To me, I was like, yo, son, that's the illest line I've ever come up with. And you guys hate it because you don't know what it means? <laughs> Fuck right, you. Right, right, right. But you know what? Just Advance knew what it meant. So I got a phone call immediately like, yo, son, that's <laughs> ills. I'm like, you see, I wrote that for you, my yeah, nigga. Yeah. You know what's funny is that you had like a post recently about how you would talk about Dwarven folk. <laughs> yeah. GS Advance. Right, right. And like, it sounds egotistical when... It's very KRS one level when you make a tweet like that. Yeah. But I've built with you brothers and you really have a wealth of information. Like there's more going on. Like, you know, in the rhyme, like you said, all you do is what you said. You said all you do is um, lift weights and eat meat. You know Hell what I mean? Yeah. Like, all I do is lift weights. But and there's eat a steaks. lot of there's a lot of reading and study that goes along just because like there's so much that you're learning that's going into all this stuff. It's just crazy. You know what I mean? Like it, it just. It makes things sound good, but it also makes you say, like, yo, what, what, what the fuck was he saying, though? So it, it gives a record. A, a but see, the thing is, uh, you know, a lot of people stop at certain parts of rhymes, but I might connect the beginning part of a verse at the very end. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and like I was saying before, I might put double, triple entendres in there, you know, a line that means four right, different right, things. Right. You and, know then, what I mean? and then revisit it at the end. And then revisit it. Right, exactly. Right. So you got to listen to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Like even that, uh, all I do is lift weights and eat steaks. Mm -hmm. But then the second part is I bite the head off snakes and write rhymes with a wooden stake. Spanish Van Helsing, advance <laughs> everything. Advanced everything is something that GS Advance, uh, as a crew that GS Advance used to have. So ah. if you didn't, if you didn't know that, you didn't know Advanced everything. Peace to GS and PS. Your peeps are peons. I'm beyond every piece of earth I've ever put my feet on. You know what I mean? A Sith Lord slash a beat apart with a big sword. <laughs> Clean up on Al Four inside of the Kith store. So you have to know Star Wars, right, right. and you have to know fashion. Mm -hmm. To get that line, you have to know right, what right. the kit store is here right. in New York City and in L.A. And then you also have to know what a Sith Lord is mm -hmm. and the fact that he doesn't even use a sword. But if he if you had to describe what he used, it'd be a big sword. You <laughs> know what I'm saying? <laughs> I try to right, put right. all that shit in there, man. And you have to, like you said, yeah. it, on the first listen, you're not going right, to get right. it. And, and that's that was the third part, because I said the three, the enunciation, the vocabulary. But it's all from a, a, the third thing, a greater knowledge and wisdom base. You know what I mean is useful information and grim experience, you know? So like a lot of guys can have a lot of knowledge that is useful, but then they sound preachy, didactic right, on right, the right. mic because what we need from, what we love from an MC is that they have real experiences yeah. and you have a lot of hard times experiences and they come across on the mic, but you also have um, such a knowledge base that you can turn it into comedy or turn it into like a grim pictorial, like, yo, right. this is just what the, 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 the hell that, jail was about or the hell that the streets was about you know what i mean well a lot of my a lot of my favorite teachers and i use that word whether it be a person who actually physically taught me in school mm -hmm. or a person i read a person that right. followed their teachings you know right. my favorite teachers and the ones who stuck with me the most were always relatable mm -hmm. were not the preachy ones the preachy ones i always tuned out right you know what i'm saying and they might be the smartest people ever but i just tuned them out i wouldn't know because i tuned them out Mm -hmm. But the ones that were relatable to me and my experiences were my favorite teachers and the ones that their teaching stuck with me the most. Mm -hmm. So I try to, you know, uh, uh, 
put a little bit of teaching into it, but make it relatable at the same time. So I don't sound like too, because yo, the illest thing to me is being the smartest person in the room, but nobody in the room knows you're the smartest person mm -hmm. in the room. That's the illest thing to me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and again, you know, there's a saying, uh, if you're the smartest person in the room, change rooms. But my room is GS Advance, Spit Gems, A1. These are the smartest motherfuckers I know. And so we sharpen each other's mm -hmm. swords every time. We, we, we lend each other books. We sit there and preach. We've gone to studio sessions where we have a beat and we're going to make a song. And we've talked for three or four hours about uh, dreams. And we broke out a dream book and started, and not on some like fucking teenage girl shit, just on some like what these things, <laughs> right, right. where did this come from? Why do we dream? And we get so deep <laughs> without mushrooms or anything that three hours have gone by and we're, we're all smarter because of it, but no work has been done, but we still <laughs> shake hands like that was a good session. That was a good session. That was a good session. <laughs> well, let, let me, <laughs> let me segue because one of the best songs on, on, the added songs on the Spicasso was the Seppuku in, in, in B minor, yeah, right? Yeah. And obviously, you know, Seppuku is when the samurai, you know, returns himself, you know what I mean? And um, it, it's, um, it has all of, of, of Broken Home. And I'm going to start. When you talked about competing, though, some of the lines that these guys came up with on this album were so fucking clever, like, when I when I first heard the song, though, I was all over GS Advance, right? Yeah. And today, for some reason, I can't get any of A1's lines out of my head, though. <laughs> Especially, and it caps up, because when he says, the, I'm not the nice Asian guy that goes, I don't want to yeah, fight. Yeah, those are one of trouble. And reminds me of all those movies, and they go, I don't want to trouble. Right, right, right. They always say that in the movies and shit. But he had funny lines. He had deep lines. He had clever lines. And um, this, making a, a broken home I get posse cut must be annoying because you must be going like, oh, that, I'm nah, fuck it. I'm doing mine again. Like this has happened. Like where you go, nah, nah, I heard yours. I'm doing my shit again. Oh, let I, me fix this again. Like I would, I would never go back and fix a verse hmm. after a homie of mine has sent me their verse. But we've done songs together live in the same room right, right. where we've definitely changed lines either because, and the crazy thing is, Cause even uh, me and me and A One on uh, damn I forgot what song it was I think it was the Wreck Ali song uh, we both mentioned Mike Tyson and comparing him to uh, Ali but we both did it live so when we both spit it for the first time to each <laughs> other we're like oh shit well now I gotta change it like, right oh, right fuck. somebody so, gotta you know, change it yeah well whoever had the iller line get to got to keep it you know right, what I right. mean if your line wasn't as ill as my you line you guys are so unique does. Do one of you ever go like, oh, I got this line, but it would be doper if you said it because you have, you know, like everybody like say like your cadence would fit perfect with this. You should build, you know, hype off this line and just does that ever happen? Like, no, nah, I don't I don't think that's ever happened. And mm -hmm. not and not really because I think it's more because, you know. You Van Gogh wouldn't dare walk into Picasso's studio and change a brush stroke. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Even though Van Gogh was ill, right, right. Picasso was ill, he, that shit would just not happen. Right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so it's the same way. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I'm not going to change my brother's brush, brush stroke. Right, right. And I'll give my opinion, and we've always given opinions to each other, and there's definitely verses that have either had to be changed or not made the song because it's like, yo, son, there are four master swordsmen on this song. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, oh, I gotta, gotta fix this. You gotta right, like yo, son, like, you gotta fix it, or it's not gonna be a broken home song. You know what I mean? Mm. But it's ill because it's, it's always ill trying to figure out who won the song out of all of us. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's it's. I haven't decided with the sepulchre, so I can't. Oh say man, I, I that, love that. That, I that love song that is so track. good. But let me put you on the spot for all of broken home. And hold on, before you go no, on, I'm sorry go to ahead, cut you no, off. I don't want people out there to think that broken home is just. F U Spit Gems, GS Advance, and A One. There's a lot of other people that that make Broken Home. As a matter of fact, Broken Home was around before I even started rapping. Yes, you know yes. what I mean. It was a crew in the story of uh, uh, Submariner, Late Night, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Halo, um, uh, Tech. I, I don't want to you know leave nobody out. I'm just 
talking about throwing names out there, you know. So they were around doing their thing in their younger days. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of them are still rapping. Some of them are not. You know what I mean? Mitchell Ames is part of Broken Home. Right, another great MC. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I don't want people to think it's just us four, but it's basically us four who do more with each other under that name. Gotcha. So a lot of people associate it's just us four. You know what I mean? Um yeah, so I, I didn't want people out there to be like it's just. Yeah, I'm just, glad. So I'm glad you mentioned that because I've covered other the, as a whole. Got spit gems ideas about it in the history, you know what I mean? But like right now, people don't know that. Right, right. But I, 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 I want. I don't want Broken Home to be the greatest crew without a group album. <laughs> that that's what I don't want. You know what I'm saying? Right, so right. I always have to press whoever I'm with. Like, well, you know what? It's it's tough to get all our schedules. <clears throat> You know what I mean? There, when we were at Goblins, man, it was a time where I was working at night three nights a week. So I had mad free time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't with my daughter's mother at the time, so I didn't have a girlfriend, so I was single. You know what I mean? A um, couple of the guys, they, they weren't working. A couple of guys was just hustling. A couple of guys had no kids. So it was like mm -hmm. we all had extra free time to be in the studio all the time. Right. That's when it should have happened. Now, you know, I got a fucking mortgage. I got a nine to five job. You know what I mean? GS Advances daughter is older, needs him home more. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with Gems. You know what I mean? He's working hard. Right. He's got his his daughter. And the funny thing is that his daughter and my daughter are better friends than me and Gems. Like they talk to each other every single day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I gotta yeah. ask my daughter to ask his daughter. You know what he's doing? It's it's, it's mad ill. It's dope though. You know what I mean? Right, right. It's the babies. You know what I'm saying? His mm -hmm. seed, marry his seed. You know, marry <laughs> yeah, my yeah, seed. yeah. That's how we keep tag money all in the family. <laughs> you know, it's like it reminds me of that shit. But um, yeah. So like now it's just it's a lot more difficult. Even with Sepuku, um, I I, I spit my verse. Um, I got it to GS and GS spit it. So we, we did it together, and then uh, Gems was out of town, so I had to kind of tell him, like, yo, son, like, I'm getting ready to push this out, and I need you on this record. So he sent me the record. Uh, then, you know, same thing with A1. A1's working, so, you know, his schedule is all crazy. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't lock him down, so he had to send it in. So it's a little difficult, but it's not. De it's definitely not out of the realm of possibility. It's something that we talk about right, right. You know, and all I'm the just, time, I'm every time throwing, we're together. I'm throwing this out there because we get so many – overly lauded albums with fucking seven songs. <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind like a seven song album from Broken Home, even if it's that like this would be a, a real a real burner. Like Yeah, no. Nah. Yeah, I'm just saying because you guys and then GS fucking teases everybody with these Instagram <laughs> videos and it's like, yeah, I did this in two seconds and he's like and I'm like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> No, listen, it's it's something that we talk about every time we're together, man, but it's just, it's harder to execute. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's a yeah, lot yeah, easier course, to talk yeah. about. And we all want to, you know what I mean? We all want to get together, but it's a lot harder to execute. We have had plans of like, yo, let's take a weekend. Everybody takes the weekend off. We pull in our bread and we get a studio for the weekend. Like 48 hours, we get a camera crew in there. We get an engineer for 48 hours. We order oh, food. Great. You, got you the, know what I mean? You we got get, the album, documentary of it. Right, yeah. right. We, we, we get a video or two out of it maybe. You know what I mean? We, mm -hmm. we get whatever uh, 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 alcohol or, or, <laughs> or fucking drugs we may need or not need, whatever the case is, and we just lock in. Um, but, you know, with the lives we lead, man, it's a lot, yeah, a lot it's definitely, easier it's said definitely than hard, done. Yeah, it's definitely hard, though. It's just something that... Uh, it's the only thing I think I think about that hasn't been done that I haven't heard in these. When it when it happens, decade, yeah. bro, it's gonna hurt a lot of feelings, man. I'm telling yeah, you, it's I, gonna I hurt a yeah, lot. Yeah, I of don't care feelings. about their feelings. <laughs> 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 it's gonna hurt a lot of crews out there because I I hear a lot about who's the illest crew from here and who's the illest crew from there. It's gonna hurt a lot of their feelings so when it happens. In in the the Spicasso, right? Right. Tell me again about the vibe that you had on this one that you wanted to do uniquely because. Every album, you were going for a certain vibe. And this one, when you added them, what was the vibe that you were going for here? Well, I mean, <clears throat> so what I did, obviously, is a take on uh, Picasso. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the word to downplay Hispanic people in the past has been spick. Oh, I absolutely. take it. 
I take it and I'm just like, yo, son, I don't give a fuck what you got to say. Mm. I'll be whatever the fuck you want me to be. But I'm so ill that I'll be that and be an artist yeah, at the artist same time. Picasso. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, it's one of the dopest slang names. Ever. You know what yeah. I mean? So I'm like, that's where I'm going to take it with it. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and let's just let's paint these stories, man. Let's take these. Let's take this paintbrush and let's paint these stories. Mm. Um, and a lot of those a lot of those lyrics came about from real life. You know what I mean? Mm. I have a. Uh, there's a song where I'm like, baby blade in the phone case with A1. Uh, and that's because A1 used to carry a fucking little blade inside his phone case. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's real life shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, jumping off the pier and went swimming in straight linen. Like, that's from fucking us fucking around and just, you know, I did that. I was dressed <laughs> up, dressed up all ill with the linen on. And I just jumped off the pier and went like, so I'm like, yo, let's tell these tales. Let's tell these real life stories, these relatable stories. They're not overly... They're very braggadocious, but they're not overly mm-hmm. like, you know, some unattainable fucking, you know what right, I mean, right. Rick Ross shit. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not telling you that I'm Scarface. You know what I mean? But when I say, you know, school of hard knocks, you know, uh, 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 summa cum laude, it's because, you know, that's that's how I am, man. Vons mm-hmm. Corona classic, summa cum laude graduate. <laughs> Vons Corona classic was, you know, school of hard knocks. Remember the, the this clothing line? It was Vons Corona classic got on you, the back. Got you. So these are all real life tales. So when I when Curse was sending me these beats, I'm like, yo, let's put this shit together and let's tell these tales, man. Mm. So it went from, you know, telling these mythical tales to these Donald Goins street tales because uh uh you know, with drug eyes, fire escape life. Right. That was that was very much a Donald Goins novel to me in my head. Gotcha. This was a character. Right. You know what I mean? Uh uh and then, you know, Papa Dios, obviously, the biblical stories, to now this is like, I'm just telling real stories about me, about my past, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And I, I don't even know where I'm going to go next with it. I haven't even, I don't even know what the next chapter is. Yeah, it's crazy. I, you know, all the things I said about if you listen to them, listen for them on this album, though, like the, um, you said you weren't taking everything super, super serious, where you said like this album... If this is just fucking around, this is ridiculous career. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. You know, like, yo, yo, hip, listen. Because right now, then hip-hop, it would be Steph Curry. You know, warm ups. Hip hop is ridiculous. It's ridiculous to me. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm not trying to be delusional and trying to to live that um, uh, little pump lifestyle you know what i'm right. saying and not to knock anybody but i'm just i'm not thinking that that's where i'm gonna go with it um i'm rapping for my friends you know what mm-hmm. i'm saying so when i i have not taken yeah. anything seriously i haven't sat down and like <clears throat> scratched my head and like damn i hit writer's block like that's never happened mm-hmm. because i've never even taken it that serious well i'll tell you I might one day what i've gotten from <laughs> this album though there was so much i learned about the about these verses that i didn't know and there was so much that I got out of it, the cleverness, the ideas. There's so much more to talk to you about, but that's all we got time for in this one. Thank you for having um, me, man. Go. It's on Spotify. It's on It's on the title, right? So yeah, if you have Spotify, you can listen to it. You know, don't fucking front on it. Buy it because or, or give it the thousand plus streams that it deserves so he, he gets an actual buck out of the shit. Yeah, so I can get like you know 12 I mean? cents or something out of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like a thousand yeah. streams. Yeah, but it, it's... um. It's a great, it's a great work from a great MC from one of the greatest crews ever to me. Thank you, brother. And um, it, it's just a, it's just a joy listening to it. I, preparing for writing about you or or interviewing you is so much fun because I get to be an f you world and be a <laughs> dickhead to everybody quoting lines though because it comes Word. out so arrogantly wonderful when I when I repeat them. But yo, until next time, there'll be a lot more stories to tell, writings to recite, and records to rewind and reminisce, including this one still. I'm your host, Sunez, and as always, the Power Right Show is a never-respect-fake broadcast. Peace. Peace.